I think, therefore I am. But I'm thinking all the time, and I don't know who I am. Am I? Are you? I'm in the middle of nowhere, and it's a good place to be. Welcome to Just Nowhere with Dr. Samuel Zinner. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Just Nowhere with your host, Dr. Samuel Zinner. And welcome to my desk here in the mountain village of Aula in Tuscany, Italy. Tonight we have a very special guest, Professor Stanislav Krajewski, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw in Poland. He's also a leading activist in the Jewish communities of Poland. And he's written uh, quite a bit about philosophy, logic, mathematics, and to a certain extent on theology as well, especially Jewish thought. And he's argued that mathematical models, when applied to theology, usually may be helpful, but they're not necessarily productive of new knowledge. Uh, a possible apparent exception would be Edwin Abbott's The Flatlanders novel. And so, Professor uh, Krajewski, Stanislav, uh, can you uh, start us off right, with the discussion of this apparent exception right, to this rule? Uh, f flat uh, uh, entities, like, you know, rectangles or whatever, and they live on a plane, and they are completely flat, two-dimensional. So, from their point of view, a three-dimensional entity objects, a solid object, can, which to them is only the intersection of that object with the plane is something that is tangible to them. So it's another sh flat shape, but when it goes using the third dimension from one place to another, it somehow miraculously changes the location, its location, and that to, to them, to those flat uh, flatlanders, mm -hmm. it looks like a miracle. So this is yes. a nice illustration of what a miracle can be when you have an additional dimension at hand. And yes. this, uh, this is quite nice. Again, does it really explain theological matters? I don't think so, but it really is, is very, I think, very creative and in some ways very uh, impressive. So now this model of mine that you mentioned, it was um, I, I, I invented it when I was reading Martin Buber's uh, I, Thou, and then there's a line there, let me quote, the extended lines of relations meet in the internal Thou. The extended lines of relations, he meant the relations basically of relationships of human of human uh, yes humans. and when there are there's a relation you know you, you can see the behind the, the the partner the other person of the relation you can see that somehow you know eternal or absolute thou or you or really this is his way of trying to introduce god as an uh, result as an re, as a result of the interhuman relation. Yes, and I think it's very interesting and it's good for our age. I think to think in this way. But anyway, the way he expressed that idea, and of course it's expounded much more uh, 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 there, uh, compre comprehensively there. So it's really something that we immediately brings to mind to those who know what it is, the projective mm -hmm. geometry. Yes. Because in the projective geometry, you have the normal, in the plane geometry, geometry, you have the points, but you also have, in addition to normal points of the plane, you have the, the so-called points at infinity, which correspond to the directions of lines. If there is a line, it has a direction, and this direction is somehow represented by the point at infinity. And by the way, it has one point. The, yes. the, the line has, you know, of course, goes, you know, in both ways, but uh, the direction is just one. 
that is the idea and so whether you go this way or the opposite way you get the same point at infinity and the more more than that you know all those points at infinity together they uh, form a line at infinity and when you look at th things this way then you know it turns out that two points both normal and the, the infinite ones uh, always in, uh, determine one line and two lines whether normal lines or this line at infinity they cross in one point so there is a complete and uh, perfect uh, symmetry and you know many things have follow mathematically from that now yes. the idea uh, was that um, that you know that the line at infinity that point at infinity is somehow what is suggested by the relation between those normal points or say normal human beings and the whole area of the the points of at infinity forms this line at infinity which can be seen as the mathematical representation of transcendence so transcendence is somehow behind and you know out of not not in our world but it's somehow but it's somehow you know reachable or it's at least suggested by what is happening in our world yes and so it's very nice i think uh, as an idea and it can be really illustrated as a model in three-dimensional geometry by this no he hemisphere for example the northern he northern hemisphere uh, what we can imagine and the 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 points at at the equator are those uh, additional points like at infinity and this this is really a good mathematical model and the point is that you we two points that are opposite to each other on the equator they represent the same straight line which on the sphere it is like a this is called a great circle yes and the shortest way between two normal points on the hem northern hemisphere and this is by the way how the air airplanes usually fly when they, they go from one place to another right because this is the shortest way and the shortest route and so that's but be but those two opposite points on the equator they must be identified because they represent one just one point at infinity and that is something that is difficult to imagine but that's i think is a very good uh, way of imagining image or representing the 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 transcendent the transcendent yes. and uh, in addition to that as you mentioned i i i i somehow used that and i really i am using it from time to time to as a tool this Im, this you know imagined model as a tool uh, assisting meditation during the uh, saying this this Jewish prayer Shema Israel here or Israel uh, Hashem our God Hashem is one or Hashem one or unique or whatever there are many commentaries on that but that's not the point here the point is that I somehow imagine myself on somewhere there or maybe even on the top of the like the northern uh, pole yes and uh, so other humans are somewhere there around me those who are you know close to me religiously which means jews are closer the others but what whoever and with whom whomever i can enter into a relation the you know what we see behind that person what i see behind that person is is that eternal though or the this you know the the figure of god or the idea of god or whatever however you put it and and it it and it's uh, and it's always you know somewhere there on the equator but we put the opposite points of the equator as one point one Im improper point point at infinity and what is more we do one more step which is going beyond the projective geometry or the model of projective geometry beyond it namely we identify all those improper points 
as one point because God is one and this is what we can imagine that somehow they are or all you know become one point that's yes. even harder to imagine but that's good transcendence should be yes. difficult to imagine and yes how it works yes yes well uh the first thought that occurs to me is well could could we then uh, as a thought experiment start at the point of unity and then go the other way and so we 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 not only can end up with unity but we can begin with the unity and then it branches out to the poor would that work i mean my mind is uh, spinning from from the whole metaphor from the whole illustration so forgive me if 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 that's incoherent but uh would that work and that's a, a very good idea and that's that perhaps more works better with uh, all sort of neoplatonists you know uh, I pictures of how the the universe develops from one <laughs> creator one. or whatever <laughs> but uh, in this projective model a projective geometry model I'm not sure how to do it how to start right. from one point but certainly you know and anything is possible in this realm they go, right course, then I yeah. Right. I, I think I'm mixing uh, metaphors or models because uh, if you apply it to the, the Shema Yisrael, uh, this, this seems to be a different scenario than the Neoplatonic, the perennial question, uh, right, the relation be, uh, between the one and the many, right, on a I cosmic so. scale, right, even, even though they might overlap to, you know, in various ways if you qualify uh, some of the details. Um, but it also occurs to me, uh, I, I, I remember you mentioned, uh, forgive me, uh, I can't recall the philosopher's name, I believe he's a Polish philosopher, and you mentioned that he developed this model, he points out that Aristotle gave us a third person philosophy, and uh, Descartes, of course, right, uh, with, the, with the cogito ergo sum, gave us a first person philosophy, a boober gave us the second person philosophy. Yes. But the question now is, is Buber's second person philosophy in some sense plural, right? Because we have the, the three persons in the singular column, right, in grammar, but then now we have this, you know, the, the uh, uh, we, you, they in, in, the, in the plural. So is Buber's model, because it's I and thou, somehow plural, basically it's individual you are absolutely right i think it's it's a good model of interhuman relations with all those implications you know in concerning the, the say the divine mm -hmm. but the fact is that we need something like a plural like a plural um, aspect to be represented and this hasn't been done properly as far as i can say as yeah. i can uh, see so it's uh, and especially you know in uh, in inter in, in, in completely interhuman meeting perhaps it's enough to have the two individuals but mm -hmm. if if it's an say interreligious meeting interreligious encounter which i am interested in mm -hmm. then when you meet someone who is of a certain religion you are not supposed to just ignore that religiosity or the religion of that other person of course and to take it into account seriously would mean that you take into account not just this person but the whole you know background which is also other person so it's like from i though it becomes like i you plural you in some mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. and yes. this becomes a much more difficult or complex model to to, to think about and but it maybe can be developed yes well uh, I, I believe you did point out right in, in your boober model that this uh, plurality right you can connect it to the plural suffix right in elahenu right so you have a plurality of sorts there given that right uh, elohim or elohim as it said traditionally right it's, it has this strange plural form which we'll talk about later but uh we we could also uh connect that plurality to the israel 
Um, is that correct? Yes, of course, not grammatically, but Israel, of course, is a plural entity, obviously, uh, like, as humanity is. And uh, in fact, it works in the same way in the model, in, mm -hmm. basically. You, you may you may make uh, uh, some sort of distinction, but basically they they in the model they they have the same roles, which is good. I mean that's mm -hmm. that's how it should be. I think. Sure, sure. Well, each community is is unique and important, right? Uh, to be be preserved. I also am interested or in interreligious dialogue, interreligious relationships, and uh, so what springs to my mind then is this. Uh, echo of the Shema right, in the Quran uh, in, in a, one of the most important Muslim prayers, as far as I understand. Um, and it adopts the Shema by saying, instead of here, it says, uh, say, cool, say, um, God is one, right? So it leaves out and, I, and uh, please, I don't, don't misunderstand. I'm not criticizing, right? I'm just pointing out the, the clear parallels. So it it just simply states, say God is one. So it's leaving out, right, the, the specificity of Israel in the Shema, right? So it's as if it's, right, applying it to a different group or perhaps it's trying to universalize it. I don't know. But my, my point is that um, I think even there, uh, even though the collective Israel is not mentioned, I believe it would still be understood, right? That who is to say God is one? Well, everyone, right? Ideally, right? So uh, just as a, a, a small parallel there for the sake of right uh, interest in, in interreligious uh, dialogue. And th that, of course, also would bring up uh, you know, the, the Christian communities, right, because they're also um, involved in, in in this whole history, I think, um, since um, Jesus, according to the Gospels, also says that the greatest commandment, right, would be, right, here, O Israel, right, so the Shema, and then to love God. And so uh, I believe your Buber model which is founded on the Shema, actually has good potential, right, to be uh, used in dialogue with both Muslims and Christians. But right, I'm not going to present I myself would as an expert. I'm very there. happy to see, to see yes. this. But the fact is that it's just a model and how, you know, creative or how uh, deep it is, is another question. I think it's a, it's a serious question. How good those models are. I think it's a very nice illustration, but is it more than illustration? This is this other problem that I, that, uh, which, which is interesting and I don't have a good answer, unfortunately. Yeah. A, I suspect that in the, the while in science, mm -hmm. mathematical models are not only illustrating, but they are really, you know, uh, showing or getting, you know, to the uh, real uh, configuration of entities, of things. Mm -hmm. And that's why they can suggest new evidence, which can be then um, tested empirically. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this has happened, you know, all, all the time in, in sciences. Yes in various sciences, but in the humanities, I don't think it's possible. The illustration can be suggestive, it can be very nice and can really mm -hmm. give some sort of satisfactory picture. Mm -hmm. But I don't know any good example of the situation in which, you know, some new aspects or even new facts are somehow mm -hmm. suggested by the model and it can be then tested and say, oh yes, now we understand things mm -hmm which we had not uh, imagined before. This is not really happening, I think. There is one exception, though, which is perhaps not, uh, which is only apparent, uh, an apparent exception, namely, mm -hmm. there are some statistical analysis of texts, including the religious or holy texts. Mm -hmm. And then when you have uh, some, some statistical, you know, um, 
irregularities, uh, then you can say that another text, you know, written later or whatever, can be seen as this similar or this similar or something like that. So this so, sort of uh, analysis can be can be made, but this is about text, and the text is a material something you know concrete that you can analyze with yes. some methods. But ideas and the values that are important for the humanities are not really, I think, um, part of that possi possibility that you have a creative role of mathematical models. Yes, uh, uh, yes agreed. So I, I think I could summarize that um, by saying that the mathematical models in science, right, can lead to new knowledge, new discoveries, or um, greater approximations to, right, uh, a certain goal of truth, right? So, a, a ever more refined approach to to some uh, conclusion, right? Whereas, um, in theology, if we think of mathematical models. Uh, such as the one the, that you developed, uh, which is very, very intriguing, very suggestive, and, and, and also uh, very practical, right, for, for meditation and religion. Uh, but the question would be then, does it produce um, a new discovery in theology that had not been known previously? I would probably not, right? That's uh, that's my yes, that's my yes. guess that it does not. Although, if it does, if somebody can show a good example, that would be wonderful. Yes, it would be. Well, so well, we can conclude this subject, I think, then by saying, if I may, that we're left with two top, really uh, intriguing and suggestive models to keep in mind, and that's Abbott's Flatlanders and uh, your uh, Buber Shema Yisrael model. I, I think because of the projective geometry, the lines of infinity that meet at a unit, there's a lot to think on and it's, it's very challenging, right? And so I include your model in that because it's so challenging, I cannot um, presume to say I, I've understood it completely. So I, I think it's it's worthy of, of of more contemplation. All right. Um, let's let's jump to this uh, next question since it ties into uh, something I mentioned earlier, and that is, uh, what is your explanation or your attempted explanation for the this odd plural form of the Hebrew, uh, the main Hebrew word for God, Elohim, which is famously plural oddly right yeah yeah so this is the one of the most important names for god used in the hebrew scripture and it's uh, in uh, it's plural uh, it's unclear why but even more is puzzling namely that it always is practically always is used with verbs or adjectives in the singular form yes so it's ungrammatical use of that of that uh, name, which is the characteristic for the for for Hebrew Bible, and that's that's very strange, and it's not properly explained by the traditional commentators. Which is which, this is strange because then usually they really try to explain each detail, even tiny detail of the text. Yes. Uh, sooner or later, you know, they discuss it and explain, but this is not really done, and which is very strange. In addition, it must be mentioned that the, the term Elo Elohim uh, in various forms is also used to describe various other uh, powers, human or non-human powers. Yes. So, and so the normal, so there are normally, you know, that the, the real God is above all Elohim, above all powers. And then, of course, if it's used in this sense, then the adjectives or verbs are grammatically put together in, in the plural form as, as they should. 
Yes. But when it is it refers to the one God, it is always un, ungrammatically used. Uh, and so the question is why? So the I try to to see what was said, and you know the answers are are more or less like either the, you know that this is supposed to say that all the powers of this world are somehow under the this one God or are uh, controlled by one God or a, a flow from one God, and yeah, but this this is certainly the biblical idea, but this doesn't really explain why the name is used in plural. And some other attempts, like for example, Hermann Cohen, who about a hundred years ago wrote mm -hmm. his uh, great book, and he was a major philosopher, and uh, at the end of his life he was coming back to his uh, Jewish theological knowledge and considerations. And he produced that book in which he does mention the the point and what was and he wrote let me quote that yes. it it is really a, a puzzle it's so puzzling he said that that is that uh, um, that uh, that of course the intention of the word is not that uh, that there is some plurality in God, of course not, but the the it seems as an almost insoluble riddle, he says, yeah. and that you know, and so he treats it yes as a perhaps a, a leftover of the polytheistic times. Mm, yes. So yeah. that there, so this is a flow, a flowed. Uh, um, uh, phrase uh, expression um, but uh, it has but because everybody understands you know that mm -hmm. everybody who uses the term what it really means that you know this is an it, it is relevant at least in Nokis, the the flow that it's still plural rather than singular because there are singular uh, cor uh, corresponding singular terms that can be used in uh, in hebrew like yes. el or Eloha or Eloah, depending on how you read it. Mm -hmm. And so it this it's not that there is no choice, but it was but still all sometimes those other terms are used, but almost always this term in plural is yes. used. And everybody has been um, you know completely ac accepting it and it's every, we are used to it. Yes. Now my so my point is that if this is so, so th there should be an explanation that would explain why it is not only the case, but it's the it's good. I mean, it's a solution of a problem that is sub that is an important problem from the traditional point of view. And and my my suggestion is very simple, although I don't think it has been made. It was made. Be, be, it was ever made before, although maybe it was, but I haven't heard about it. Namely, um, the idea, it's not that this is a, there is a new message involved. Of course, that would be rather ir irresponsible to think that we can have a new message. Yes. You know, uh, detect a new message just by anal analyzing a word, but a message that is well known is that God is one, there is no plurality, and when you use the other name of God, Hashem, you know, the yud hei vav hei the yes. right, proper name of God, so to say, then of course, as ev every proper name, it is it suggests unicity. There is no, nothing, no other entity that can be named uh, with using this name. Right. But when you use this general Semitic name Elohim, which is just a general name, and it's very similar to Allah, for example, in the yes. uh, linguistically in Arabic. So then we, so they, then the question is why we are using it in and in, in more and even in, in in an ungrammatical way. And my an answer is that it does. It does contain a message, 
And the message is the well-known message, God is one, and there is no category in which we can have God and anything else. That is, God is one in a very, very strong sense. It's, there is no category we can apply to God. It's not there are many gods or many absolutes or whatever, and he, it's one of them is the biblical God. No, we want to somehow convey the message that it's, there is no common denominator of God and other anything else. And this is something that is being pro said, pronounced, proclaimed in many ways by the traditional prayers. But I think yes. the very name Elohim in plural also does convey the same message. Why? Because this name is the only general name, as opposed to proper names, which cannot be put into plural. If it were El, then you can put it in plural, Elim or whatever. But if it's Elohim, you cannot make a plural of a plural because it's already in plural. Mm -hmm. So the plural name cannot be put into the plural form. So it suggests, or, or rather it conveys this message that it cannot be generalized. It cannot, there is nothing similar that can be put side by side by side, by side just because we use the plural form and the uh, singular verbs and adjectives. So this, the uniqueness in comparability of God is expressed by the very form of God's name. Yes. Right. And then, then the, yes. And the, the um, one of the key parts of that uh, is the use of the singular forms together with it. And that's really what clinches the argument. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And um, I've, um, uh, not to boast, but I've, I've read a lot on this subject and I have not come across uh, this argument before, I'm not aware of it either. And so uh, it'd be interesting um, to see uh, if any of, of the listeners right, will um, have, will ever have heard of this. I, I, I tend to doubt it, but it's an extremely intriguing ar argument uh, because, right, it's it's a problem that is present, right, in the very first line of the Torah. I mean, you know, Bereshit bara Elohim, there it is. It's like it's there, it, the very first line, uh, perhaps by, by design, right? So, um, you know, why hold back the challenges and the mysteries, right? This, put it out there in the very first line, right, of the Torah. All right. Uh, all and right. by the way, we don't translate it properly because we always no, translate right. it into English and other languages, Polish and other, as, you know, at, at the beginning or whatever, the God created. Bara, but uh, the best, better translation in English, it's not so easy, but it would be something like uh, at the beginning when God's Mm, creates when gods creates right yes like to make it ungrammatical again yes it, th that's a good point um, but it's, it's very challenging even the first part right because in in Bereshit, uh, th there is no definite article of course so even you know in the beginning really really it's not literal it's more like with or at or however you with um, a beginning or ahead or right because it's it's multivalent in hebrew so uh, one should really learn their hebrew right, if, right. <laughs> to read the torah um all right so related to this would be uh the, the question i sort of skipped which is more uh challenging challenging right and it's uh, from the domain of of logic and theology all right so when we're talking about arguments for the existence of god we usually in these arguments consider God as an object, right? And um, in one of your papers, I believe it was actually co-authored, uh, co if I'm not mistaken, uh, you, you then mentioned that there is also a possibility in these arguments for the existence of God, there are also a kind of argument where, wherein God would not be considered as an object, right? And so 
excuse me, this is traditional, that, that God is not an object is pretty well present in the tradition one yes. way or another and in modern philosophy also, you know, for example, Levinas says mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Dieu qui vient en l'idée, you know, he comes to, to mind or, or that, the, you know, the, and, and, or Rosenzweig who says that, that there is no that existence is not the same in for if we think about god and if we think about the world these are not two ways of the same existence these are completely different ways of existing but yes so now my point is not just this is not, but it's not an object because this is rather well i would say familiar yes my point is that and this is not completely you know different from what some other people are saying but but it's uh, it's it's a bit stronger that not only we don't have good uh, uh, ways of saying what god is or what are properties of god we also mm -hmm. should or could uh, simply refrain from saying that god exists existence yes. is also not applicable to god i think mm -hmm. which doesn't mean that i somehow uh, uh, say that God does not exist. Understood. It's not the same at all. And the best way perhaps to uh, to make a comparison would be that we can ask whether justice exists or not. You know, to say that the justice exists is rather strange, you know, where, what, what would it really mean? But of course we do talk about justice all the time and justice is very important in our way of you know, relating to, to the human world and to the world. Yes. And the same, I would say, with meaning. Meaning is not an object also. Meaning is something very important you know, and the meaning of our being here, of, of the world, of our life, whatever. But it's not an object that we can talk about. It's a way of looking at things. It's a, a light mm. that really somehow illumine, can, can illuminate the objects or oh, there is a, a, a verse in a psalm that's saying that you know god is light in which we can see lights the other light can be seen because of god's light something like this yes so in this sense it's not that strange to say that we try to we can try to say that existence is not applicable to god but but uh, uh, because it's somehow not it's not the the way to to look at to look at god it's like yeah. but it's not only that i i mean i have a, this comparison that i think is of interest uh, because i i've been dealing with mathematics for many decades and yeah. and i am originally a mathematician by training and and i and I noticed that par interesting parallel between, uh, you know, this way of approaching God, that we do not apply the category of existence to God, mm -hmm. and the way mathematicians and uh, professional mathematicians and even the brightest mathematicians uh, approach the question of the existence of uh, mathematical objects like numbers. Mm, yes. When asked about numbers, mathematicians would say, "Okay, yes, sure, we deal with them. They they exist as 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 well, perfectly as as other objects in which with which we can deal in our lives." Yes. But when asked, you know, really pressed, you know, in what sense do they exist? They 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 really are not sure. They 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 say, no no no. Well, I don't know. Maybe maybe they don't. We behave as if they existed but not doesn't really mean that they exist somewhere out there or some you know in some way that is because that it becomes then like a like in a fable you know like in a something you know what does it really mean no no and uh, and so if in mathematics we can we can have the situation that, that we don't know whether numbers exist but still we use the numbers and we use them very successfully yes then maybe you know in theology we can say that the existence of god is not a, the issue really it's not something that we should consider 
which is of course going against the very important and, and dominant tradition in theological studies. But we should, of course, use, we, it's not strange that we are using the term God as if God was an object, because there is no other way to express various things as we use the numbers, because there is no other way to express various mathematical things. Yes. And so this parallel, I think, is very interesting and very illuminating. Because mathematics seems to be so, you know, well defined and so, so obviously, I mean, valuable, mm -hmm. and nobody really denies the the mathemat the the meaning of mathematics and its its usefulness. But many people do with respect to theology, and uh, but if there is this parallel, it would show that perhaps you know we should be much more charitable to, yes, yes. to talk, thinking about theology. And also I have another parallel which I took from uh, another philosopher, mathematician, Byers, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, is uh, the metaphor, using the metaphor of a rainbow. Rainbow yes. is a, something beautiful, we all know about it, but the fact is that the, that the that a rainbow is not an object. A rainbow which seems to be somewhere there from time to time, you know, it's it's not there really. We can only see it, but we can so it's not an object, but it's objective in some sense because it's uh, it's not that we see it in a whatever form we, we imagine. No, we see it in a specific way and there is a f optical physical way of explaining the, the the rainbow of course and we can photograph it and everything so yes. it's objective but it's not an object so there might be objective uh, parts of the world which are not objective because they are they we deal with objects but for some other reason so in for the rainbow we have the a good scientific explanation and we know what Mm -hmm. what it why and how it works i think that for mathematics we don't i mean we not don't really know why numbers are are seen by us as ob as if they were objects but we deal with them as if they were objects but maybe we can somehow sooner or later uh, invent or propose a uh, a way to 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 understand why yes. and the same would apply in some way to to the divine matters that that these are god is not an object but it's the, the way of it's inevitable to i mean it's uh, the it's it's good and inevitable to use the uh, this term in order to express certain deep truths about the world and our being here Yes. Well, you, you mentioned that m meaning is not an object, and that's very helpful uh, because um, I perhaps want, perhaps one way of saying it would be that meaning is the background or the ground from which all of our discourse emanates, right? From which we we create grammatical objects, nouns, etc. Et and so, if we apply that analogy to God. Uh, then uh, I could see how that could be helpful because now God is not an object, strictly speaking of discourse, but God is sort of the, the of course, this is all metaphorical speech, right? But the background or the ground from which we will consider, right, all of these uh, various theories uh, about the existence of God. And, but to say that God does not exist, I believe, of course, has eminent support from uh, Maimonides and his doctrine. Um, you know, famously, there's this tension between, let's say, the, the apophatic approach of Maimonides and then at the uh, Aquinas um, doctrine of analogy, the analogy of being, right? And so nothing can be compared um, between creation and the creator or God because the existence that we share, which is right, philosophy calls it contingent existence, um, is not 
what is meant when one talks about the existence of God. And so for Maimonides, he's quite radical on this, right? This quite radical on this approach. So that uh, I, I think that's the natural place to go um, is Maimonides, right? When we say God does not exist because the meaning of existence, right? As applied to creatures cannot be applied to God. Yes, although I don't think Maimonides would say that because he, of course, did say that God well, does exist. And had arguments for the existence of God. For the existence of God. So in this sense, I think it's going a bit further in the same direction of it's apophatic in a even stronger sense, which I think is possible in our uh, our era to say that it, it, even existence does not apply to God, yes. let alone other attributes, of course. Yes, but my point is that you, you do have a right to to found the argument starting with Maimonides and then to stretch the argument, right? I, I, think, I think... I think so. Uh, yes. yes. I think you're yes. right. Yes. And um, uh, one, one brief point uh, on, on this uh, issue, which, which will usually come up. Um, I, I like to ask this of uh, any philosophers, especially, uh, or theologians that I happen to speak with. And um, all right, I recall um, the, I believe it was the 2012 Copernicus lecture that was given by uh, the physicist George F. R. Ellis. And he was very harsh, um, I, I think rightfully so. He, he was very harsh in taking to task uh, physicists like Lawrence Krauss and others um, for not for being good physicists, which they are, but for being bad philosophers, because they would argue that, well, there's, um, the, uh, the concept of God or the belief in God is greater is irrational because we can explain through physics how to get from nothing to something, which of course, as you know, totally overlooks that the nothingness of philosophy and theology is not the nothingness of, of quantum physics, for example, or the, or the physicists. So the question for you is this, um, what would you think of my argument? And that is that a physicist as a physicist does not have the competence to affirm or deny whether a God was behind the Big Bang, for example. Now, they, they can learn philosophy and theology if they want to and speak from that. But just as a physicist, this question uh, of God, uh, that's beyond their competence. That's not their field. W would you agree or w would you I absolutely that? agree. I absolutely agree. And the point is that from for the physicist as a physicist, Yes. You know, the world is composed of matter, and that's not, and that, that's the only way to 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 investigate to to, to study the world from the physical point of view. Yes. And of course, this matter in, in the nineteenth century they thought matter is only corpuscular, corpuscular, but we then learned that it can be a, a field or whatever, and 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 waves and things, but or quarks or whatever, but it's it's still, you know, material and mathematical, by the way. Physics is very, as we know, very mathematical. So those objects, when we go, go deep enough, become very, very mathematically sophisticated. And the connection between, the, you know, the, all those very sophisticated theories and the everyday physical experience we have, is not that close. I mean, it's really uh, another issue. But but the point is that this is the assumption of a physicist that everything is, a, is is material, and that's that's okay. I mean, that it has it has to be that way. But yes. from this, you cannot infer that that there is nothing uh, that is nothing else in the universe because this was your assumption rather than than anything else and so yes, yes you may somebody can have can can propose another assumption it's a bit like you know with the now we have this, this great success of of um, uh, you know of, of computers and programs and all those things mm -hmm. so the idea of digit that the, the, the digital 
uh, realm is so important yes. has led some people to to say that okay so the world is really like a huge computer or like a huge you know um, um, uh, program or whatever that it's really the world can be seen as a l huge program in some mm -hmm. sense computer mm -hmm. program right. if you are consistent enough you can try to develop the, this sort of approach mm -hmm. but again this is a certain uh, uh, assumption rather than the reality of the world right in a former age the clock was the metaphor that science latched onto and saw the universe as a giant sophisticated clockwork right, right? now it's computers so yeah. yeah good point yes um all right let's try to bring this to a close now with, with my final question um if you may indulge me and that's uh can you uh, tell us what is your your argument from gratitude for the existence of god that's yeah of course uh, i know it sounds rather strange even funny uh, i'm not saying that we, we can uh, prove it or mm -hmm. in the existence I, I just a five a few minutes ago i said the existence doesn't apply to god the point is that gratitude i think is very important and gratitude is is beneficial to us to be grateful and there are whole studies of gratitude, as I have learned recently, and showing that really people who are more grateful for whatever reason, they have better lives, generally speaking. Uh, and I think that gratitude is something that we experience from time to time. Now, not, perhaps not everybody, but to those who experience this gratitude in a fundamental sense, I mean, that sometimes I have experienced that, I would say. I feel not just grateful to my parents, you know, due to them I am here, but and my ancestors and my teachers and my community and my and the humanity and whatever and those who invented all those things like computers and and you know the possibility of of remote con 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 connections that we we are using now so we, of course i am grateful to all of those but i am also somehow fundamentally grateful sometimes i feel for to not ask nobody specific but in general i'm grateful in general it's a, like a fundamental feeling of gratitude and now the next point is that if there is gratitude, it must be to someone. I cannot be grateful to things. Mm -hmm. Some people say they are grateful, I don't know, to the mountains. That I love hiking in the mountains. Some people love that. Mm -hmm. So people say, oh, I'm grateful to the mountains. But are you really grateful to the mountains? I think it's, it's, it's misusing the, the term. We are grateful only to someone to a person to mm -hmm. personality otherwise it's it's just not using the term proper so if you have this fundamental feeling of gratitude and the the gratitude is to someone so the question is to whom to whom is that gratitude that fundamental generalized gratitude and uh, you know for my being here for the fact that things are as they should be, despite all the problems that we all encounter all the time. And, and if so, then this person with capital P, if you want, mm -hmm. is, uh, is the somehow emerges as the counterpart of the feeling of gratitude. So if anyone has felt that and agrees with the assumption that gratitude is the person or the personality rather to a, to a thing, then, you know, this suggests that conclusion. Yes, very good. Yeah, and, and, and I uh, should point out that you have presented this argument in the context of this question, which, which is really a burning question these days, very controversial question of um, 
artificial intelligence, right? So I believe the way you phrase it is, could a robot be uh, right. grateful, right? right? And uh, you have various arguments, and uh, I know you have a very, uh, just for a reference, uh, everyone out there, uh, uh, you have a very interesting paper uh, where you uh, point out a logical flaw in Roger Penrose's argument, right? Um, about robots and, and consciousness, but you end up, I believe, supporting his main contention after all, right? Once, um, you know, the, the, the error in logic is, is, is corrected. Um, I have um, friends at, uh, in Silicon Valley, I have friends uh, who do projects for DARPA in the United States, and they uh, increasingly, not this was not the case a decade ago, but increasingly now, at least uh, the people I speak to are increasingly doubtful that um, a program, a software, which is really what we're talking about, a robot or a computer could r attain real consciousness, the type of consciousness that humans have. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the reason I am told for that is, which makes a lot of sense for me, uh, when I think about human cognition and all of this, is that you, um, it makes no sense. You know, the old idea of a vat, uh, a brain in a vat, right? uh, that a brain detached from a body could be functional is ludicrous. You need the whole mechanism, the sensory input from the spinal column, from your fingertips. And what makes us human is not just the brain. And so we our consciousness um, if I'm not mistaken, is also being informed and formed, right, by most of the sensory input from our entire body, right? Uh, if we're out hunting, for example, uh, it's just not our brain that is calculating whether or not a risk is worth the, the meal. It's uh, 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 data is coming in from, from everywhere, and uh, right? And so, also, um, what about emotions also? Because these are not only pertaining to the brain. Uh, I would argue that emotions also have a lot to do with our stomach. What, what do we eat? And this is going to really affect potentially our emotions. If we eat too much sugar, we have a depressed emotion, right? And so without the stomach and the environment of the bacteria, it's not going to work. Anyway, I'm be, you can see my bias. Right? No, no, I, I fully agree, by the way. But who knows? Maybe, you know, the robots of the future robots will have a body and maybe even a stomach and a the cyborg bacteria or whatever. It's imaginable that they can have all those, not all, but many of those things. Yes. Now, the so. point is whether there is some sort of human characteristic that is not possible to emulate or simulate in robots and uh, so of course there are some ideas like you know the humor for example but perhaps you can teach a robot to have some sort of a sense of humor although i'm not quite sure what it would mean but it's not not impossible so other other emotions they try now to to somehow simulate some emotions with the robot in order to make it more realistic exactly because of the reason that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. My point is that maybe, you know, being grateful is one of the most difficult and maybe unattainable aspects of, of our human uh, behavior, of our human personality that cannot be really uh, simulated but, uh, because to have a real feeling of gratitude rather than of course the robot can be taught to to say oh thank you i'm very grateful that's very easy <laughs> yes, yes, feel yes. That, to feel that it's <laughs> this is the problem so maybe yes. this is like one of those last you know ways of of defending our specificity Yes, we shall see. And I'm very grateful to you, Stanislav, for uh, spending this time with me. Uh, you're very eloquent, and what you have to say is very enlightening. And so thank you so much for being I here. I thank you very much. I'm really very grateful to you for uh, asking the questions, for or having read my some of my papers, and I'm really 
happy it is happening and I hope it will have some effect. All right, you're welcome. Best wishes. If you enjoyed the program, please consider supporting this channel with a donation through Patreon or PayPal. And don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.